Steve Larmer was born in Peterborough in 1961. His career began as an underage player in minor hockey with St. James in the Peterborough Church Hockey League. He played through this system to junior, winning numerous All-Star and MVP honors. Playing with the Junior A Peterborough Peets in 1977-78, again as an underager, his talent impressed the OHA's Niagara Falls management, who drafted him for the 1978-79 season. In 1981, he was selected to the OHA second All-Star team. Chicago Blackhawks drafted him for their American Hockey League team in Moncton, New Brunswick, where in 1982 he was chosen to the AHL's second All-Star team. On his first full season with the Chicago Blackhawks in 1982-83, Steve won the prestigious Calder Trophy as NHL Rookie of the Year and was selected to the All-Rookie Team. He played in two NHL All-Star games in 1990 and 1991. Lummer also played 15 NHL seasons, all but two with the Chicago Blackhawks, where his, durabil where his durability was exceptional, playing in 884 consecutive games. His final two seasons were with the New York Rangers, and in 1994, he won a Stanley Cup with the Rangers. In 1,005 scheduled NHL games, he had 441 goals and 571 assists, and in 131 playoff games, he added 56 goals and 75 assists. In 1991, Steve played for Team Canada, which won the Canada Cup and also a silver medal at the World Championships and you were nominated for the Peterborough District Sports Hall of Fame in 1998, which I'm assuming was the last time you heard that bio, but <laughs> do you remember 1998, the day you got inducted to the Peterborough Sports Hall of Fame? Well, I remember getting a call from Dougie Gibson with regards to, uh, you know, being inducted into the Peterborough Sports District Hall of Fame, which was, a, uh, you know, for our hometown kid here that, mm -hmm. that was born and raised and, and grew up watching all these guys like Dougie Gibson and Bob Ganey and, and the Johnson family and the Evanses and I mean, it, it, you know, a great honor. Now you and your brother, that's, that's who you came up playing hockey with. You guys are separated by one year. Um, where did it all start for you guys? Well, I think, you know, we grew up on Western Avenue. So back in the day, they, you know, the city had outdoor rinks and and stuff like that. So, and we went to Keith Whiteman. We lived right, backed right onto the, the schoolyard or whatever. So all winter long, I mean, with the city building these outdoor rinks all all through the city, you know, and they had two in Keith Whiteman. So, I mean, we spent most of our, our waking days, you know, out on the pond, playing hockey all day Saturday, Sunday, before school, after school. I mean, even back then we could play at recess. So, we spent a lot of time, you know, outside playing. Were, were there times that you guys had to pull yourself off the ice or was it always your parents or another parent kicking you off? Well, mom would always flick the light at the back door and when it was time to come home for dinner or it was getting late and we had to get up and go to school in the morning. So that was always the, the light switch going off and on. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's better than a cowbell, it's pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah, it's hard to hear when you got a toque on yeah. and you're focused. <laughs> now, you and your brother also, you kind of develop, you're both goal scorers. Where, where do you pick that up on the pond? Well, I think it, you know, I mean, there were no, I mean, basically you threw sticks in the middle and, mm -hmm. you know, threw a stick this way and that way and it wasn't really five on five. It could be, you know, four on four. It could be eight against eight. It could be you know, 10 against 10. So I think, you, had, you know, and it was, you know, eight and nine year olds playing against 14 and 15 year olds and 16 year olds or whatever. So there was, you know, it was as much as it was pond hockey and that, but you really learned a lot about protecting the puck and playing. It was more keep away than it was mm -hmm. anything else. So you were able to learn how to control the puck and stop and turn and, you know, kind of, make some moves to get around people and stuff like that so and there was no you know when you're outside like that there's nobody harping on you about doing it this way or that way you're yeah. kind of learning it yourself which is usually the best way to do anything uh, in life absolutely yeah. and yeah. now for you do you remember how young you were when you did start skating there are people you hear they're in skates at two years old was there a a normal start for you? Well, I think Dad, uh, he had a ba uh, rink in the backyard when we were younger. So I think we started skating when we were around three or four years old. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we started to play organized hockey until 
we were maybe seven or eight. Well, and that was with the church league in Peter. Yeah, yeah. And you came through. You started as a younger player than the rest of everybody else. Well, I in played with group. my own. I played with my own age, all the way up. Mm -hmm. So until I, uh, I think it was right around uh, Pee Wee, because they always used to have like this the city league team and the church league team, and there were two different organizations and there were two different rep teams and and whatnot. So I think right around when I was. Uh, novice or peewee, uh, they kind of amalgamated and they come up with the uh, Peterborough Minor Hockey Association, which is the AAA yeah. team as we know today. Mm -hmm. And uh, once they amalgamated that, then, uh, you know, was the best kids from both the church league and the city league playing on the same team representing the city. It's like a Mighty Ducks movie is what that is to me. Yeah. <laughs> you might not have seen the Mighty Ducks. I have seen okay. it. That's okay. Well, there's, yeah. that's exactly what happens in that movie. But um, So we got your winters down, Pat, in Peterborough. We knew what you were doing. You were on, uh, on the rink uh, right by your house growing up. Now you transition into the spring, the summer, the fall. Uh, a lot of people are playing baseball or, or they're playing lacrosse. Where did you go? Well, we played, uh, I played a little bit of baseball, I think, when I was younger, and then uh, lacrosse. And it was pretty much the same group of guys from hockey that played lacrosse or, or ball and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, you were still, still hanging out with your friends and, mm -hmm. and, you know, playing a game that you loved. And I think there was a lot of uh, good lessons, you know, learning how to play lacrosse and whatnot. And we had some great, great lacrosse teams when we were kids uh, growing up that competed in the All Ontarios and the All Canadians on a regular basis. If were you better potentially at lacrosse than you were at hockey? Is there any sport where you were at the same level? Um, I don't think so. I think I was a decent lacrosse player, but not good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was not fleet of foot. <laughs> so, um, you know, that kind of hindered you back then or whatnot. But we had some, you know, we had some great players on our team. Larry Floyd and Steve mm -hmm. Smith and Mark McGillis and Cal Sweeting and and I mean, it, it, some great players that made it fun. Yeah, you're, so you're growing up with elite athletes and the hockey side and, and the lacrosse side. Yeah. And what did you take from, from your peers that, that you applied to your own game? Is there anything you learned growing up in terms of a style of play or an attitude towards sports? Well, I think we always, like our teams were always competitive. We were always competing for, you know, I don't know that there were very very few tournaments that mm -hmm. we never made it to the semifinals or the finals and and whatnot. So we were a, uh, a good a good group, a good age group, I yeah. guess you would say. You know, right from the get go, all the way up through till till midget. So um, there was you know it was a fun group to play with. We had lots of really good players and and lots of depth, and uh, so we were able to compete and you know either get to the finals or or the semifinals of tournaments and always you know won a lot of championships in the playoffs and stuff like that so um there was always you know this push to work hard and and to be the best that you could be do you carry that through to your pro hockey career how many years did you miss the playoffs was it just the uh, one? none 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 okay no. so yes you did yeah. carry that clean through to your your professional hockey career and and now let's fast forward a little bit beyond minor hockey to when you're an underage player with the Peterborough Peets. Uh, Gary Green's the coach of the team. It's a team that's going to go to the Memorial Cup. He scored a goal in the Memorial Cup as a 15, 16 year old. That had to be just an incredible feeling. What was that season like for you playing in your hometown as a 15 year old? Because there were different rules back then, right? It was that you could play for your hometown team. Well, you, back then it was if, if you were, uh, it was a 17 year old draft. Yeah, okay. So in order for a 16 year old to play in the OHL, you had to get, you would have had to have been drafted in the first two rounds. Mm -hmm. So that never happened. Um, and from there it was back, back then, a lot of the, because the training camps weren't as big as they are now and, and whatnot, and the drafts weren't as many rounds as they are, you know, you would bring in some local kids to help fill out with yeah, makes training sense. camps, makes sense. some midgets and some minor midgets and stuff like that so that you could make two or three teams to get through training camp. So, mm -hmm. And that's basically how it all started. And, and it was, uh, 
you know, had the opportunity to come out and, and to skate and participate in training camp and and then uh, I think on the Thursday or whatever I was playing lacrosse then on the midget team and mm -hmm. we were going to the All Ontarios for the weekend and I had to go and talk to Mr. Green and say, you know, Mr. Green, I'm not going to be able to be here this weekend. I have a lacrosse tournament down in Whitby for the All Ontarios mm -hmm. or whatever and. Uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity to come out, and and he kind of looked at me and said, "Well, listen, you guys, good luck down there this weekend, and we'll see you on Monday when you get back at practice." <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's, that's you know, and and that's kind of how Gary was as a coach. He was probably, and I tell this to everybody that I know, he's probably the most honest person I ever played for, and uh, it was just an incredible year playing with that group of guys and. And, uh, you know, the experiences, you know, of, of, you know, winning the OHL and going to the Memorial Cup was, uh, you know, something I'll, I'll never forget. What sticks out to you more? Was it, would it be your first OHL goal, your first NHL goal? or? Well, if, I can't remember either. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just... There were a lot of them. Uh, yeah, but you, you think of... You know, and everyone, I don't know, you, you kind of get hung up on goals and assists and mm -hmm. points. And, and I mean, it really is more about the experience and the people that you ex get to experience it with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that year, you know, being a local kid, you know, playing for your hometown, we had a, you know, it was an older team, and, and, but just a great group of guys that made you feel welcome right from the get-go and did things to help you in, in helping your development and stuff like that. We had, you know, great leadership with, uh, you know, Mark Curtin and Keith Acton and Paul McKinnon and Randy Johnson and Jeff Brubaker and uh, just, a, there's solid people mm -hmm. to begin with. So, and, you know, the, to welcome you in and to help you with things on the ice and during practice and stuff like that. and. It was just a, a real cool experience. For Ke a guy like Keith Acton, he went on to become a coach. Could you sense that when he was playing here? Well, you know, you, I think you know, he was going to be successful as a mm -hmm. player and as a coach just because of his, his attitude. He always had a positive attitude and, and a real hard worker. You know, he wasn't the biggest guy. He was a, a real good skater mm -hmm. and, a, and great with the puck and all that kind of stuff. But um, it just you know, that work ethic. And when you get to experience that, I think, as a younger player, I mean, that's the one, I think, common element that all these players have that go on to play yeah. is, number one, it's a, a real strong work ethic. And that, I'm guessing, came from Gary Green, who had three, those three great years. You, you got to watch on from a distance when the team won the Memorial Cup the next year. Yeah, what was the that next like? year, yeah. What was that like for you to... To have played with those guys, like there wasn't an option for you to stay because you get drafted by Niagara. Yeah, I got drafted by Niagara, and then, <laughs> and, then uh, I mean, and you know, and that was a great. I got the opportunity to play for Bert Templeton in in yeah. Niagara Falls, and you know, another iconic junior mm -hmm. coach, uh, and loved playing for him. You know, and we had the, I think we had that year, we had probably fifteen first year players, like 15, 17 year olds. And uh, we actually won the Western Division and played Peterborough in the wow. finals, who went on to beat us yes, and yeah. uh, win the Memorial Cup. So uh, it was a little bittersweet losing yeah. to them, but I was real happy for, you know, for the guys I knew and the, and the players that I had played with mm -hmm. the year before to go on and win the Memorial Cup. It was well-deserving. That's an incredible first two years of, of I guess, semi-pro hockey, hockey or almost yeah. pro hockey. That yeah. had to be an incredible experience. Uh, going into that, though, like I can't imagine being a hometown kid like you were uh, as the 16-year-old playing in Peterborough, and, and you're dealing with a new group of people, but you have your, your friends already as well. Was it difficult to balance that going into it? Well, that's a real tricky thing because yeah. you're getting pulled both ways, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a, they were a good group of guys, and was, like there was an older group, mm -hmm. so they, you know the older guys tended to 
stick to themselves and, and whatnot, away from the rink and whatnot. So, I mean, I went to Kenner, which was not too far from here. So, you know, I would go to school during the day and, and then walk over for practice at four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Mark Reeds would give me a ride home after. And that's kind of how my day was. Well, and then the next year, again, we're going to fast forward again to to your first game back here after playing the season with, with the Peterborough Peets. What was that feeling like? I know you had a lot of bittersweet moments in that year, but, but what was that feeling like coming back? Well, you know, it's always nice to come back and, you know, as yeah. a visiting player to play in your hometown, get a chance to visit with your family and your friends and, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, we were a young team in Niagara Falls and, uh, you know, learning the ropes. And, and Bert was a really good coach for our group at that time. And, uh, you know, was able to push us and, and uh, we had a great year. Yeah. It was fun, to, you know, it's always fun to come back and play. And, you know, especially when we had a young team and it's hard to play in this rink with the square corners. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, it's hard. Yeah. And I had a little bit of knowledge about that. So, you know, there were some times I think where I could get away with cheating a little bit more because I knew what the bounces were going to be. Yeah, it's... It's it's amazing actually that this the arena still exists. It, it's slightly different with uh, the adjustments and they, they made to the new boards, but it is amazing to watch how much of an impact it can have on a game sometimes. Oh, big time! It's a you know it's a hard game for for when you get trapped in a square corner, it's hard to get out. Yeah. So. Now you can't help but draw a parallel between you and your stepson Jr. And you probably don't want to speak on his behalf, but how much are you trying to? guide him through the process of being the, the kid from the area playing for the hometown team as a top end draft pick. What, what do you try and impart on him? Well, I, I mean, the only thing I can help him with is, uh, is the mental part of the game and the, and the confidence part, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, he, I think he's got great skill. He's a great skater. He's good with the puck and, and all of that. And it's just a matter of you got to start to believe in yourself and, and play with confidence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that comes from playing and, and whatnot. And, you know, my experiences of being a young player here and, and whatnot and having to go through all of that, I think I can help him with some of that. Mm -hmm. But it's the mental part. And, you know, I have Gary was really good with me and gave me an opportunity to play. And, you know, I didn't play a whole lot up until Christmas. And then somebody got sick and didn't come back. So I kind of got plugged into a line and and uh, it kind of took off, you know, in the second half of the year. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, preparation is nine tenths of it because at some point in time you're going to get your opportunity, but you got to be able to run with it too. But so hopefully, you know, I can help him with the mental part of the game and, you know, there's going to be ups and downs and things aren't going to go the way that you want them to at different times. But, you know, you'll, you'll work your way through it. You're, it's all part and yeah. process to learning. Did you ever want to be a coach? No. 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 You sound like you'd be a pretty good coach. No thoughts about it at all? No. No. <laughs> no, well, it's too, uh, no, it's different. It's a yeah. different world now, right? And yeah. they play different. The rules are different. The, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a hard, you know, the expectations are different. Yeah. I think than they were when we were playing junior because it was not really, you know, I mean, I think you'd, you'd dreamt of playing in the NHL, but, you know, I mean, the reality of it was, was it really going to happen? Now, even for you, you were a sixth round draft pick to the NHL. Yeah. When you got drafted, did it feel like this is my chance, this, this is really happening, or did it still feel like it was that far in the distance? Um, well, I think, you know, I, I, getting drafted that late was, you know, I, you know, yeah, it would, uh, you know, I went second overall into the OHL. Yes, so yeah. what happened in four years, <laughs> right? <laughs> it definitely went downhill real fast. <laughs> but you know, there are you know things about your game. I think that you're always yeah. trying to work on, and you know, people don't like this part of it or that part of it, and and whatnot. So, I mean, for me, it was, you know, you just keep working and and doing what you're doing, and at some point in time, somebody's going to believe in what you're doing, right? And yeah. I mean, I've always had that with, you know, you know, first with Gary Green and giving me the opportunity to start my junior career here in Peterborough. And, you know, Bert Templeton 
had a big influence on us in our first year in Niagara Falls. And, and then, you know, getting drafted to, when I got drafted to Chicago late and, uh, you know, I had the, op, you know, the privilege of playing with Stevie Ludzik in Niagara Falls for three years. Yeah. And he had gotten drafted to Chicago uh, too. Mm -hmm. We both got, went there in the same year and whatnot. And, uh, you know, so it was nice to be able to experience that with him. And then, you know, we went down and we played in the American League. And, you know, we didn't even think we were going to make the American League hockey team that year, let alone, the, mm -hmm. you know, to play in the NHL. But, uh, you know, once again, I had a great coach down in, in Moncton, in Orville Tessier, who used to coach in uh, Kitchener. Okay. Uh, coached my brother for two years, so he was a little bit familiar with you know our family and, and whatnot and just another coach that believed in me and you know and kept me there and and put me in you know good spots to play why do you think coaches believed in you well i don't know <laughs> I, I, you know I, that's <laughs> the goals you scored could have had a factor it could have been a factor, well i think I yeah but you're always you know and i've seen it you know you know, when I played junior, when mm -hmm. I played pro, and all these guys come in and they're like, you know, high scorers, first rounders, second rounders, whatever, and 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 then they're playing on the, you know, the third or the fourth line. You know, you go from playing 18 minutes a night or 20 minutes mm -hmm. a night to five minutes a night, and it's a hard thing to adjust to, you know, and then you're playing with, you know, the old running joke is, okay, what part, you know, what piece of the puck do you want me to play with? when you're playing on a third or fourth line because mm -hmm. most of the time it's get to center, dump it in, and forecheck, right? And when you're a skilled guy, that just doesn't fit your yeah. game. So it's hard to be successful and do what you can do when you're not really put in the right position. So, so and, you, and, and Norville yeah. did that. He helped you get through that, I guess. Well, he, you know, played us with the right guys. All I right, was, yeah. you know, fortunate enough to play with Ludzi. We were, you know, you know, started out as the third or the fourth line, and by Christmas we were probably our, our second line, and we were getting power play time and and stuff like that. And I mean, again, you know, we had a great group of older guys that were were down there playing that that really helped us, you know, learn and yeah. become professional hockey players. How to manage a winter in in Moncton? What, what was what was it like living in Moncton? A guy who spent his his whole life in pretty much southern Ontario. Oh, it was, uh, it was a great year. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I got to live with Ludzi, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, we had spent three years playing together in Niagara Falls. We actually lived together our first year in Niagara Falls. Uh, so, you know, I was familiar with him, and we were great friends, so that made it easy. And then, uh, you know, we had a, a lot of really good older players, uh, Billy Riley and... Miles Zaharkel and Lowell Loveday and Mike Kozicki and Dave Farish, uh, you know, some older guys that had spent some time with the Toronto Maple Leafs, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're actually their, their farm team moved from Moncton to Cincinnati that year and, and these guys were kind of their discarded guys that they didn't want to pay in American money, so, wow. they, so they sent them down to Moncton, right? And, so players uh, in... But they were great, yeah. great with us and and uh you know really helped helped with our development was that the same in the NA? i know now it's us dollars across the board for for pro hockey players was it actually if you're playing in canada you get paid in canadian dollars at that time? well back i think back yeah. then it was yeah wow yeah so getting drafted to a, a team in the states had a bit of incentive i guess a little bit more. well uh, yeah when i played in niagara falls my first year i think the canadian dollar was worth more than the us dollar okay so it made going across the border a lot better I need to work on my <laughs> financial history then. <laughs> and when you're rookies in Chicago, I, I read this uh, just as a quick tidbit, and I mentioned to you before, but the, the rookie cards were misprinted for you and Steve Ludzik. Yes. And yeah. uh, your face was on his, and his was on yours. So you yeah. guys spend all that time together. Did, was there an explanation for the mix-up? I know you guys got confused for each other a lot. Well, I can't believe they, you know. <laughs> I can't believe they mixed up an Irishman with a Pollock, <laughs> but <laughs> what can you do, right? And that's uh, that's a running joke kind of between us. Is mm -hmm. that uh, that's you know that's made us more famous than anything else is to mix up with our rookie cards. It's quite rare. You'd imagine <laughs> like at a professional level that the tab that happened. It's quite rare, but yeah, hey, 
There yeah, but that's a it's a it's a unique card, yeah. to say the least, right? So. Do you have one? I think I do. Wow. Yeah, I got one of his. Very cool. Yeah, he's got one of mine. <laughs> it's the one that makes sense. It absolutely <laughs> makes sense. And now to the NHL, you went after Moncton, and you got off running. Sixth round draft pick wins rookie of the year. Was there a bit of a chip on your shoulder in that year? No. Uh, what happened was they had fired the coach the year before in Chicago, and uh, they hired Orville, who okay. was our coach in Moncton. All right. <laughs> so here we go again, yeah. right? You got somebody that likes you that's mm -hmm. in your corner and, and, and whatnot. So, uh, no, he, he uh, when I played in Moncton, we won the American League Championship, so we won the Calder mm -hmm. Cup that year. Uh, so when Orville was named uh, head coach of the Blackhawks that summer or whatnot, we, you know, go to training camp and, and go through all that, you know, workouts and practices, exhibition games and whatnot. And he ended up keeping, uh, I think, five or six of us from that team wow. that he brought along with us. Uh, so I think there was uh, myself, Stevie Ludzik, uh, Dave Feemster, Jack O'Callaghan, who you know was part of that uh, U.S. Olympic gold medal team, uh, Lake Placid, yeah. uh, Bobby Janicek, goaltender. So you know, once again, you have a coach that you know knows what you can do, likes you. You know, they're trying to. I don't think their year was as as good the year before, uh, so they were looking to make some changes. So it was a good opportunity to come in and and uh, show what you could do. And, and uh, you know, Orville was confident enough in me to, uh, you know, pull me aside during training camp and tell me that he was gonna put me with, uh, you know, he was thinking about playing me with Dennis Savard and Al Secord because he thought they could get some more goals from mm -hmm. the, the right side uh, than what they had, had gotten the year before. And he was right with the chemistry. He played with Dennis Savard for nearly a decade. Yeah, I played yeah. with Dennis and Al for a long time. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, have had the time of my life playing with those two guys. Great, great people, great hockey players. And uh, you see something similar actually right now. This is last season in the NHL with Sheldon Keefe coming up from the Marlies to the Leafs, and he brought along some players he was familiar with as well. And you mentioned earlier that nine tenths is preparation, and the other tenth is is just being there to take the shot. Do yeah. you feel like a lot of people are on the same level, and it's just about opportunity? Well, I think, you know, and I knew Orville well enough and, and whatnot that mm -hmm. he called me aside in training camp and said and told me what yeah. he was, you know, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try here on the right side with Dennis and now I know, you know, we're going to give you, you know, upstairs they're telling me we're, we're going to give you five or six games. So not, it, this is your chance because if it doesn't work out, you're probably going to go back to Moncton mm -hmm. or, or wherever they I think they had moved the team to uh, Saginaw or Springfield or something like that. But so, you know, he basically laid it on the line, and you know, this is going to be your opportunity. You're ready for it, and and take advantage of it. So, and that was it. And I was, you know, pretty nerve wracking for a couple of weeks and and whatnot. But at the end of the day, everything worked out well. And then you were in Chicago for not just your hockey career, but a pretty amazing thing in Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. The, the sports yeah. scene in Chicago, that must have been like Peterborough, Niagara, Moncton, Chicago, and then everything, the, all the attention on the sports scene there. What was that like uh, for your career in Chicago? Well, I, I mean, I think hockey back in Chicago was you know, probably the fifth or sixth sport yeah. as you went down. I mean, the Bears, football, huge. Two baseball teams. Yeah, yes. the Cubs, yeah. huge. The White Sox, you yeah. know, and and uh, the Bulls. Mm -hmm. And the Bulls had gone through, I think, some rough years prior to that, like the, yeah. the Blackhawks did also. And, you know, Michael Jordan mm -hmm. come in and, and kind of changed all of that like Dennis Savard did for, uh, yeah. for the Blackhawks at that point in time. Could you feel energy and excitement around the city when you guys did start to, I know you guys weren't at the top of the totem pole in terms of attention, but could you feel the energy when you guys were playing well? Well, you always, I mean, it's a really unique town because mm -hmm. they really love their sports. 
in Chicago, all of their teams. I mean, you're either a Cubs fan or you're a White Sox fan. You're not both. Yeah. Everyone's a Bears fan. They all love the Bulls and the Blackhawks. So there's, you know, you, you know, you read the papers and you hear what's going on and you know, going on with the Bears, what their record is, you know, the the baseball teams, you know, the basketball team, and you know, so it's like you know, we gotta kind of step it up a little bit and and uh, you know, start doing a little bit better. Were you with the Blackhawks when the movie Swingers came out when Jeremy Roenick? In the movie Swingers, Jeremy or Vince Vaughn is playing with Jeremy Roenick and he knocks Gretzky out and he's saying Jeremy Roenick made Gretzky bleed. Or so were you? Do you guys get that attention? Were you there for that? Um, I'm not sure if I you was. You don't remember that? Okay. <laughs> I remember the movie okay. and the scene yeah. and, and whatnot, but I yeah. can't remember at, at what point in time I I ever seen it. Not sure if you were in New York at that time. Yeah. But, uh, uh, what did you learn from the guys around you, Dennis Savard specifically? Uh, I'm guessing you adapted your game. To him a little bit more than the other way around but uh, what did you have to do well I think you just you know I th you just play your own game and do what you do well and uh, you know Dennis was okay through the neutral zone this is the guy you want carrying the puck not me not Al so get the puck to Dennis let him come through the neutral zone with speed you know gain the blue line or whatever and and you know the Al and I could drive to the net or somebody come in late or or whatnot and he was an incredible passer you know he was a a pass first shoot second type mm -hmm. of guy so with him it was just a matter about getting open and you knew he was going to get you the puck and and it was really neat you know I mean you know with Gretzky and Howard Chuck and there were some great players, yeah. great centermen back in that day. And I, you know, Dennis was the one guy when he got that puck, it, people in the stands stood up because they had no idea what was going to happen. He'd take it back to the defensive zone, right? And then well, he could, he could do whatever he wanted. Yeah. He was like a water bug out there. Yeah. He was so quick. He could stop on a dime, turn. He had that spinorama move. How that, many times did he go offside when he pulled the spinorama off the neutral zone? Well, it was, was yeah. <laughs> me, not, no. not you know, I, I wasn't that great of a skater okay. uh, early on, so I didn't have to worry about mm -hmm. uh, going offside because I couldn't catch him anyway. All right. <laughs> so... <laughs> But he did, I mean, they still show, you know, the highlights of the shorthanded goal he scored on uh, against the Edmonton Oilers. Mm -hmm. uh, they still, that's like one of the top ten goals on the TSN highlights, right, where he, yeah. he beats five guys. He actually come back and beat a couple guys twice. Um, but and I can remember hopping out in the ice and getting to center ice and just kind of slowing down and watching the last ten seconds of it because it was a thing of beauty. Do you know how many goals of yours he was the first assist on? Would you like? Would you would, be able to guess? I, yeah. I would think most of them. Yeah. Yeah. And you won the sharpshooter competition at the All Star game as well, so he had to have confidence yeah. in you when he passed you the puck. But uh, was it most? This might sound strange, but you're you're not that fleet of foot. You mentioned that was it almost an advantage with him spreading out the ice and then you just getting back and being the late man for a a shot. Was yeah. That, yeah. Well, and that was the the. You know, we had a line we had, you know, Al, who was, he, you know, he scored, he had 250 goal years, I think, mm -hmm. right? And tough. And there, there's a guy, there will never be another hockey player that scores 50 goals in a year and has probably 35 fights. Because there are teams that don't even have 35 fights now. No. Yeah. So... I mean, you talk about a unique blend of talent and, and toughness and, and, you know, he could create a lot of room and space for Dennis and, and myself. So, it, you know, we, it was like the perfect combination and it worked well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Al was there. He could, he would, you know, drive to the net. He scored a lot of goals coming in off the wing with a slap shot from the top of the circle. Uh, you know, a lot of rebound opportunities for myself and Dennis and... And, you know, and if that didn't work, you know, Dennis was able to drive the line and Al could drive to the net and clear some space. And, you know, you come in, you find that little, you know, soft spot and, and Dennis was able to get you the puck. Power forward, playmaker, and a sniper. I guess it's a pretty good combo uh, yeah. for a line. Well, it worked well for, mm -hmm. for a lot of years. And how long was uh, Orville 
your coach in Chicago and what what coaches meant the most to you in, in the NHL um, as you went forward? Would it still be him or was there? Well, we had Orville. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, your first coach that mm -hmm. is, you know, the guy that gives you the opportunity so that you can get your foot in the door at least, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll be forever grateful for that. Uh, you know, and then after that, I think we had a, a slew of different coaches over the next three or four years. Um, and then uh, Mike Keenan came in in, I think, 1986 and kind of changed the whole culture again. Did you play, did you play <laughs> lacrosse against Mike? You mentioned you played uh, lacrosse in Whitby. Uh, he's in the Whitby Sports Hall of Fame. Well, uh, I wish... <laughs> you wish you had? <laughs> I wish I would have known now what I knew then if, he yeah. was play, if we were playing lacrosse. I don't yeah. think so because I think he's much older than I am. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so Mike Keenan, you, you want to stand the cup with Mike Keenan as well, I guess, in, in yeah. New York. Um, and also, like, it, crazy to me, the Peterborough connections, but uh, on that staff is, is Dick Todd. Yeah. Um, and was Gary Green there as no, well? As no, Colin, uh, oh, Colin, Colin Campbell. Campbell. yes. Yeah. So I had three Peterborough, the, the, yeah, three Peterborough guys yeah. or, that had connections to Peterborough. And was Dick Todd with the Peets in a capacity? Yeah, year Dick year as was well? the trainer when yeah. I played my first year here in Peterborough. So I know Gary Green calls it the Peterborough Mafia. Yeah. Um, and he's, yeah. The he's the person who introduced me to that phrase, and it's yeah. And then you, you start to look at uh, the tentacles of Peterborough throughout the NHL, and it, yeah. it's, it's crazy. But how often did that come up? Um, you know, it was just not very often. I mean, yeah. but it was a real unique situation to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mike is the head coach, and, and Colin and uh, Dick is the assistant. And, uh, you know, there was a, 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 a good mix yeah. of, well, <laughs> it just was. I mean, Mike's a pretty intense guy. I mean, I played for him for many years in Chicago, mm -hmm. and, and I actually probably one of the few guys that will say I enjoyed playing for him because mm -hmm. he, he allowed me to grow as a hockey player and, and uh, you know, take on a more significant role, uh, not just playing wise, but leadership wise and stuff like that. So um, I'm grateful for that. He was hard and he demanded a lot, uh, but that's okay. You need to get pushed in order to, to become better. I mean, there were some hard days, but you get through it and, and move on. And you know, when I got to New York, it was, oh God, here I am. I'm going right from the frying pan right into the fire again. Yeah. Is this really what I want? <laughs> but it worked out. Uh, you know, Dick was, uh, you know, it was his first year coaching in the NHL as an mm -hmm. assistant and stuff like that. So, you know, it was all new to him and, and fun and uh, it was good. He was funny in the dressing room. Uh, you know, he could, you know, kind of cut the tension when things were getting a little, mm -hmm. you know, too tense or whatever. And, you know, because Coley was a pretty intense guy too, and along with Mike. So, you know, Dick was a real nice balance for that. Yeah. Well, but yeah, based on the way that Colin Campbell played hockey, you'd expect yes. uh, that there'd be some intensity there. Um, what was Mike Keenan's stick budget? Did you see a lot of broken sticks? Oh, it was unlimited. Yeah. No, he, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, this was, well, they had, they were aluminum sticks back then. Okay, yeah. And the composite, I think, was just coming out back in the early 90s mm -hmm. or whatnot. And I remember when we were playing in Calgary one year with the Blackhawks, and he wasn't very happy after one of our periods or whatever, and he came in and he tried to, he, he tried to grab Keith Brown's stick from him. <laughs> and he, Keith wouldn't let go. <laughs> this is a good stick. You're not going to grab it and break it because back then the old wooden sticks, yeah. you probably only had about three good sticks out of a dozen, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, you were actually, okay, I got to save this one for the game. Yeah. I can use the rest in practice and whatnot. And there was no way Keith was going to give that up to Mike. <laughs> it's, it was quite funny. Yeah, that, there's a way to cut the tension too, watching that. I can't imagine watching that struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And then he, he couldn't get a hold of the stick, so he, he, went, to kitch, he went to kick the garbage, garbage can, can yes. and the garbage can was screwed to the floor and he broke, <laughs> and he broke his toe. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah. yeah hey, so it's professional I, hockey I was at gonna, its best. I was going to ask you, was he a big water bottle toss? Does the water bottle toss, the gum toss, the garbage can kick, or the stick break? And I guess Mike Keenan, oh, was, Gambit. Yeah, yeah, all of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, pushing the Gatorade jug over. That was another big one. Wow. It, yeah, you hear it's crazy how a guy like Brett Hall, he talks about Mike Keenan openly after his career. During his career, he talked about yeah. how much he hated Mike Keenan. And, yeah. and Mike Keenan had his success. He went and coached in the KHL afterwards as well. He, up until 2018, he was still a, a head coach in the KHL. So his, his style yeah. applied and worked. Well, it just, you know, and I think he softened over the years. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, you know, he just had this, he's a great guy off the ice. Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of you know, you know, go out and have a couple beers with him, and yeah. uh, you know, a, a great guy. Yeah. But he had a switch that flipped on when he walked into the rink, and it mm -hmm. was, you know, game face, game on, and let's get ready. And you know, his whole uh, philosophy was, you know, there's 82 games in the year, and you know, on day one, we're winning 82 games. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's kind of how his mindset was and it was right from day one you were prepared and ready to go for training camp and when the puck dropped it was game on and you know we're playing to win this game it must be why he liked you Eight, 884 games you were prepared to play in a row uh, yeah I had a, I, yeah yeah I have one year that I don't hear too well over that I that's my Mike Keenan year yes so I never really heard a whole lot <laughs> <laughs> but Th that is really truly something that he must have appreciated when he looked at you and that is your your 884 straight games played 11 seasons you're you're 80 games away from Doug Jarvis and and then it just it what happened in the end it was was it a well, holdout I, with I, Chicago no I I missed the start of the year yeah. uh, before I got traded and I think it was was it 93 mm -hmm. uh, I had asked for a trade during the uh, springtime, and it never really was facilitated until yeah. uh, I think the first week of November. You sold your house so. and you moved back to Peterborough? No, I was still living there. Okay. I come back for the summer and whatnot, mm -hmm. but I went back and expecting things to, you know, get things organized and, and ready to go and, and stuff like that, and it never materialized as fast as it should have. You just but. wanted to to a fresh start in your career at that point? Yeah, I just wanted to go. I've been a long time in uh, one place and, you know, all of the, the, a lot of the players that I had played with coming up were, you know, Dennis was gone and uh, Dougie Wilson wasn't there anymore and Keith Brown, mm -hmm. Bobby Murray, uh, Daryl Sutter, you know, some of these guys that had helped shape and form me as a player. Was Daryl Sutter coming into coach? Well, he was, he was uh, getting into coaching. Yeah. He had just gotten into coaching. In uh, Chicago? In Chicago. Yeah, okay. Uh, a couple of years before that. So mm -hmm. I think he was uh, the head coach in Saginaw for a year or two mm -hmm. and then was an assistant with Mike uh, before he took over. So it just was, you know, he spent a lot of, t a lot of time and, you know, uh, in one place, and it, I just thought a change of scenery would be, you know, good for both. Good for me to kind of, you know, either go to a young team and, and help mentor some kids that, you know, you know, guys mm -hmm. had done for me and and whatnot, and or go to a team that maybe had a chance to actually win a Stanley Cup. And there you go. That's what it, it led into, obviously, yeah. with the Rangers and. If you look at that team, when you, I guess, like Tony Monte was on the team, got traded away, like the a few guys that New York traded away, if you look at it now, you say, wow, they won and they traded away those guys. But you stepped in, you became an assistant captain. Uh, what was your role on that team with, there's the Marc Messier Leadership Award, right? Yeah. He, he, was, he was the captain there. And what was it like stepping into that room? Well, just, it was wonderful experience i mean you know what an incredible leader mark mm -hmm. you know and, and you know mark had a, a good relationship i think with mike and was able to at times because mike could get a little hot-headed at times and whatnot and and i mean i had the I had the perfect seat in the dressing room because i sat at madison square gardens i could see where the coaches the coach's office was across the hall actually but they would walk in through the training room and then down the hall 
yeah. into the dressing room and I could see down the hall and it would be like on cue, you know, we'd have a bad period, you know, Mike was going to come in and read the riot act or whatever and I could see him and he'd be just hopping down, you know, <laughs> stomping down the hallway or whatever and he'd get about 15 feet to the entranceway in the dress room and I'd be like, oh Christ, here it comes again or whatever. And then all of a sudden Mark would get up and start talking and he would stop yeah. and listen. And then he would turn around and walk away. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thank God, yes. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> did, did Messier have that same view? No. No, no really? he was facing me. Yeah. He had his back to that, right? Okay. His stall was on yeah. that wall, mm -hmm. right? So he couldn't see it, right? But he just had the most perfect timing. Wow. And, uh, and I think, you know, you understand when, you know, you're playing with a bunch of guys that have won multiple Stanley Cups, you know, Mark Messier and Kevin Lowe and Jeff Bukaboom and Craig McTavish and Glenn Anderson and, and whatnot, these guys that were all battle-tested in the, in the playoffs, and that's what Mike liked. He liked guys that had mm -hmm. been there and, and had proven themselves and, and were able to do it again. Was Craig McTavish wearing a helmet in 94? No, nope, he nope. wasn't. No, yeah. he was the last guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he carried that through another couple of years, I guess. Yeah. Um, what's it like to, well, we'll get to the Mark Messier. I got to ask this before I ask what it's like to win in New York, I guess. But when Mark Messier goes to the papers, this is one of the most famous things in hockey, right? And say, we will win and we yeah. will be back. What is that like in the room? Did, do you guys take well, note of that? Not, I when you're going through the playoffs and, and whatnot, usually you're not reading newspapers, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, there's always stuff, you know, the other team's saying, the other coaches are saying, everyone's trying to get into your head. Yeah. So it's just ignore it, get rid of the outside noise, right? And the only thing you're really worried about is what's going on inside your own dressing room. So for the most part, none of us really realized it until after the fact. So, and he came out and scored a hat-trick. Came out and scored a hat-trick in, yeah. I think, New Jersey, and I think in Game 6 to, mm -hmm. to even the series up and, and get us to a Game 7 in Madison Square. Now we'll get to, I'm guessing it's got to be the greatest moment of your hockey career, but, but winning a Stanley Cup with, well, in the biggest media market in the world, I think it's safe to say, in New York, and one of the original six teams in the NHL, the New York Rangers, and they're on a drought what was that championship like it, it had to be amazing yeah it was uh it was really cool like <laughs> well it, it's it's and i mean i was fortunate enough to play for two original six teams yeah so you walk in and in the history of these teams uh you know i played with tony esposito for two years who was a childhood idol of mine mm -hmm. and i called you know I'd come down after a game, I, you know, and, and, you know, great game, Mr. Esposito, and I would drive him nuts for calling him Mr. Esposito, <laughs> right? But he'd go, no, call me Tony. Okay, Mr. Esposito. You know, but yeah, yeah. that kind of respect that you had, and to, you know, back then there, you know, Stan Makita was, was still hanging around a little mm -hmm. bit, and get to Cliff Coral and Keith Magnuson and Bobby Hall and, um, you know, just to sit and listen to the stories that these guys had, and then, and then to go to New York and, and to be able to, uh, you know, play in another original six team with all this history and all these great players, you know, Raj Gilbert, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're just, it was iconic, and we'd go into places, and you'd go to Long Island and play the Islanders, and it'd be, all you'd hear was, 1940. Right, and you're going, what are they talking about? And it was the last time, I think, that the Rangers won the Stanley Cup. Yeah. So, you know, you get to, you pick up on a little bit of that history and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it was just a, an incredible city to win in, number one. And it was nice to be part of, of that team to get the monkey off the back. And, and uh, just a great group of guys to, to play with. How do the celebrations compare with the OHL championship, the AHL championship, and the Stanley Cup championship? Well, they're, they're all foggy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, we had a big team dinner with everybody at the Waldorf Astoria, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had a great group of Russians on our team. 
uh, Sergei Zubov, uh, Karpatsov, mm -hmm. uh, Alex Kovalev, uh, oh God, uh, Sergei Mnanchinov. So, you know, they took us over to, you know, Brighton Beach and we had a, you know, they set up a great big dinner for us mm -hmm. with all kinds of food, and Russian food and dancing and it was a week of of great memories. You're exhausted at yeah. the end of it, but you know you find a way to get through it. You find the energy to, and then we just it was a a great group of players to win a win a cup with. And I had played with a bunch of guys before in Chicago because Mike brought mm -hmm. you know Greg Gilbert and Stefan Matteau and Brian Noonan and Mike Hudson, you know guys that he knew that that were able to you know fit and fill roles that that. Uh, you know, help get us over the top. How much did winning, uh, how much easier did winning make it to uh, to step away from the game when you did? You played one more season and then you stepped away, but how much easier did it make it having won that cup? Uh, it was, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, that's really what you play for. And I wish, it, you know, like everybody does, it would have happened earlier in my career. But, you know, we always seem in Chicago those years, we always seem, you know, you know, it was the Eilers dynasty. The Islanders dynasty, and then it was you could call the, it the Oilers. Islanders dynasty if you combine the two. There you go. Yeah, yeah. but there was, you know, there were what, you know, I think in a span of nine years, uh, either the Islanders or the Oilers won yeah. the cup, right? And and we always lost, you know, it always seemed that we lost to the team that went on to win the Stanley Cup, whether it was uh, Edmonton, the one year we lost to Calgary, that went on and won. Mm -hmm. Uh, we lost to Minnesota the one year that went on to play Pittsburgh in the finals. You know, we ended up getting to the finals the one year, I think, in 91 and, and lost to Pittsburgh. So, you know, we, we were close, but just not there. We always ran into, you know, I mean, you know, the Edmonton team had, you know, how many Hall of Famers on that team? Same thing with the, the team in Pittsburgh and Mario and Ronnie Francis yeah. and Rick Tockett and... Samuelson and I mean they just had great teams. Yeah. Bobby Urie, you yeah. know. You have you have to ask actually. It's a it's a pretty basic question that everybody asks. But uh, you played against uh, both Lemieux and Gretzky. The, the the debate that goes on forever. But which one was the most uh, I guess awe inspiring for you to play against? Which guy made you go wow more? Oh, well, both of them. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's, they're both great players. Yes. No question about it. Yeah. But they're two totally different. I, yeah, I know they're that. They're different but... players, so I don't think you can compare apples and yeah. oranges. I mean, Wayne is Wayne. It was mm -hmm. like the most intelligent, one of the greatest passers, mm -hmm. you know, goal scorers. You know, how do you, <laughs> how do you... <laughs> I guess that's why people talk about it. Well, yeah. and, and, but Mario was, you know, and Wayne wasn't a big guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he was six foot, maybe 180 pounds, 185 pounds, and he was smart and savvy and just, you know, mm -hmm. he was three steps ahead. You know, yeah. it, was a, it was a chess game for him when the rest of us were playing checkers, right? Mm -hmm. And Mario was just a physical specimen. And for a guy that size that could handle the puck the way he could. And, and, you know, he played a physical game and he, you couldn't take the puck off him. He was, they're both incredible. Yeah. I wouldn't want to even get into That's fair. That's absolutely into fair. That. It's yeah. just watching them. Mary Lemieux, obviously, you look at him and, and he's more physically staggering. As you mentioned, you look at that guy glide up the ice and you say, wow. And Gretzky, look where he takes the puck and you say, wow. Well, he had yeah. a... I mean, Mario would have the, you know, be coming at you, and he'd have the puck would be 15 feet on this side of his body, mm -hmm. and the next thing you know, it would be 15 feet on the other side of the body. How do you defend against that? You know, and yeah. and he was, for a big man, he was f not just fast, but he was really quick. Yeah, and you you led the NHL in plus minus one year. I know that stat gets less credit now than it used to, but uh, how much should you take pride in your defensive side of the game? You talk about defending Mario Lemieux. How much of a focus was that for you? Well, it was always, I think, a, a big part of the game. And one of the reasons why Orville wanted me to, to play, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with Dennis and Al, because he trusted me defensively. 
uh, you know, so I could help out and, 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 and do a little bit more of the grunt work. That's why I was always kind of the last guy coming out of our own end. Mm -hmm. um, but you always take pride in the little things, I think, and, and the ability to, you know, you want to be the guy that's out in the last minute whether you're up one goal to try and you know score a goal to tie it or you're down a goal and you're trying to protect the lead mm -hmm. and uh, I think that was always you know one of the things I enjoyed the most what was the thing you enjoyed the most from if you look back on your playing career back to your childhood to to when you stepped away can you can you focus on one thing well just the experiences and having the you know Playing on some great teams with some great players, and 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 you know, hockey's the reason why you're there. But there are a lot of life skills that you can learn from these people too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the experiences I had playing junior hockey in Peterborough and in, in Niagara obviously had a huge influence on me. You know, my time spent in Chicago playing with all those great players and and mentors that I had uh, helped shape me to you know go on and, and play in New York with another great group of guys so yeah. that to me that's you know the end of it and then you know today I still play yeah you know with a lot of the guys that I grew up playing with is that the, the ultimate reward and you got to bring the Stanley Cup back here as well yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I play hockey on Tuesday night with the hot points and I still you know play with a lot of the guys on our team or guys that I played minor hockey with I play with Four of the guys, or three of the other guys are on our team I played with in Niagara Falls. Wow. Vincey Zebeck, Teddy Boynton, and Stevie Gatsos, who live in the area now. So it's just a small, unique world that, uh, you know, I'm right back to where I started. <laughs> Do you need Mike Keenan in the dressing room now for no. your men's league teams? No? No, I don't think we'd let him in anymore. <laughs> but he would be funny in there. Yes. Yeah, maybe Dick. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Steve, it's it's been a joy uh, talking about uh, your your hockey history, your sports history. So thanks so much for joining us on Sports Legends. Uh, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me.